Hi, Hello, Rodney. Sarah. I'm Sarah Hello, from Sarah. The Upcoming. Lovely to meet you. Same here. Um, and thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. Maybe of you course. could just kick off with a brief intro to A Glitch in the Matrix. What can people expect if they want to watch your film? Well, I mean, Glitch in the Matrix is a documentary of sorts <laughs> about the idea, you know, um, simulation theory, which seems to be something that's been uh, an idea that's getting, I don't know, more, if not more and more popular, more and more discussed all the time, the notion that, you know, we're all living in some sort of giant computer someplace, more or less like, you know, the film The Matrix, or if you prefer The 13th Floor, or Existens, or World on a Wire, <laughs> or Dark City, um, you know, and it's built on conversations. There's a few experts peppered in, but the bulk of it is, you know, first person interviews with people who have come to believe this often after sort of undergoing extraordinary experiences. Um, in some ways, I like to talk about it as sort of a, a nonfiction uh, twilight zone. And, you know, thinking of this in the context of your other films, you know, The Nightmare Room 237, it seems as though you have some sort of obsession with obsession, you know, with other people who have go down these rabbit holes, if you like, and have fascinations with particular topics. So what got you thinking about this particular um, theme and, and why did you want to make a documentary about it? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I have a, a special love for unsolved mysteries, maybe unsolvable mysteries that, you know, nine times out of 10, you know, when, um, when, the, when the, the solution occurs, um, I'm kind of disappointed because the magic is gone. So, you know, maybe, tr maybe tilting at windmills that won't go down is, it, it has turned out to be, you know, especially you know, satisfying and, and interesting to me. I know in hindsight, I think the sequence of these films makes a lot of sense, right? That two through seven is about people trying to understand a movie and the nightmare is about people trying to understand something akin to dreams. And this is about people trying to understand um, the world. And, you know, how, what was your research process? I mean, you must've, if we feel like we go down a rabbit hole just yeah. watching it, I can't even imagine you know, how far you must have had to go into it in order to make the film. So, you know, what was that whole process like? And, you know, what were the things that really stood out to you that were perhaps most surprising? Well, I don't know. I probably spent about two years researching it before um, before starting interviews. And, you know, I had this insane whiteboard that looks like, you know, a scene from the X-Files where, you know, thousands of scraps of paper are connected by different lines and every particular milestone or deep thinker or film that had some connection to simulation theory, you know, was divided into different columns and different color codings. But, you know, the film itself, you know, the one of the fun things about these projects is the film that the, the, the film that I wind up making is never the film that I'm imagining before we go in. And as I and as I focus on people who have spent a lot of time wrestling with these wrestling with these ideas they always take it in places i never would have expected and you know not the least of which was how quickly most of these people went to um started to talk about simulation theory as a kind of religious idea right because you know very quickly you can come to think of it as you know a different a 21st century uh, creation myth and you know do you think that, did you come out of it the other end having your own theories, your own doubts? Because I feel that the documentary as a whole isn't telling you to think a certain way. It's not giving you answers. In fact, you come out of it with more questions than answers. So, yeah, yeah, well, that's always the case. Um, what's, what was your, you know, if someone was going to put you on the spot and say, what's your uh, view on the whole theory itself? And, you know, what was your personal belief? Well, I mean, there's the science of it, which I only can understand to a, a certain point, you know, and if you had Neil deGrasse Tyson on, he would go at much more depth, you know, about quantum physics and Planck's constant and ideas that I can only understand while I'm actively reading them and reflecting on them and five minutes later I'm lost again, um, but I'll do take it as, um, I'll take it for granted that people who are smarter than me see this as a uh, as a as a scientific um, possibility, you know what I find where I go 
in my head, much more towards using it as a metaphor for the kind of realities that each of us construct in our heads based on, and Emily Pottest talks a lot about this in the movie, you know, sort of, you know, both your biases, your history, your peer group, and your media diet, all right? And she compares Plato's cave, the, you know, this, the allegory of people who only see shadows of objects, you know, projected against a cave wall, thinking that those shadows, you know, are the reality because they can't see what's behind them. Um, and in the same way, a lot of what we experience, you know, is mediated through, um, you know, th through the media. And struggling to find consensus reality so that we can all live in the same world and accept the same truths is kind of the, you know, one of the, I think one of the bigger struggles, you know, of, of, of where we're at right now, you know, um, certainly in the US and best I can tell over there as well, that um, have, a, so, so for me thinking about simulation theory, you know, it kind of leaves me with a big question about um, who constructed the world that I'm living in, right? And is it something that I, is it something that, is it an accurate, is it an accurate reflection of the real world, you know, or by retreating into my own bubble, have I created a, a private reality that isn't, that isn't connected health in a way with, with, with other people um, in, in a way that's as healthy as possible, um, if, if that's not inc incredibly convoluted. And, you know, do you think, kind of touching on some of the things you were saying there, do you think it has even more resonance at this moment in time? Just thinking that we are, we are all living basically online now, aren't we, in lockdown? You know, we're barely seeing people in real life. Obviously we're, you know, in the wake of, of the Trump era, fake news, it feels like there's lots of elements of this theory which could kind of tie into that. And did you think about perhaps making some of those links more explicit? And you know, what do you think the, the added resonance is at this moment in time to watch this film? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm happy for these things to be metaphors that allow us to discuss the you know contemporary political, social um, you know crises of the day. You know, I'm th there's a one fleeting mention of covid um explicitly in the movie which is that there's a section where jesse is sort of comparing our world to life in a video game and how a lot of games that he plays are shipped too early full of bugs and glitches and are unsatisfying and sometimes impossible to play and then he emerges out from that world into this one and it's just as glitchy and problematic and inefficient and broken as the, as, as the world within the games. And to illustrate that, I've got an image from New York City when you know, the COVID was sort of at its peak and there's like this swirling red light on the top of the Empire State Building, like, a, like an emergency siren on a police car or an ambulance. And, um, you know, we, you know, sort of locked our cut in August you know, of 2020. Um, you know, if if the film was still on the editing table, I would have probably replaced that shot a half dozen times since then of other bizarre, unlikely, broken glitches in our own world. Um, so I guess I'm happy that I, I'm 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 perfectly satisfied not to hit too many of those things, um, literally, because you know if you, when we locked the movie since the time that we locked the movie, new ones have appeared, you know, and if you watch this movie next year, there will be, there will be newer, there, there will be newer ones even then. Um, I think sometimes being a little more abstract allows a movie to, you know, maybe stay relevant longer. But I mean, as you talk about the amount of time that we've been, that we've all been spending in lockdown, making the movie feel a little more um, relevant. Yeah, I mean, the, all the interviews that we did in this film were done on video chats like this and the fact that in the time since then we are all interacting with each other through those windows um you know that irony has not been lost on me <laughs> and you know what was how did you go about putting all these different bits together i mean how do you even begin to choose you know which clips you've taken bits from 
from movies, um, from archival footage. And then, you know, you've got these amazing talking heads with the avatars. You know, how do you go about piecing that all together? And how did you choose all these, you know, bits to animate and so on and so forth? Well, the, well, the archivals always come last. And, and well, maybe let's say not last, but let's say sex, if, if there's three phases, archival comes second and the animation comes last. And the first thing that I do is, you know, edit the dialogue. This is all built on, you know, the, the ground level of this film is real people telling stories um, and, and reflecting upon them. So me and I, my co-editor, Rachel Tejada, after we would do each of these interviews, we would cut them all in, up into little three minute chunks and give each chunk a name. You know, like Paul's uncle is, an, is, is, is would be one of those titles if you remember the moment where he's talking to his uncle at a barbecue. And those two words are enough for me to remember the scene. And that becomes a post-it note. And if his color was orange, it's an orange post-it note. You know, and then I have a wall with, I don't know, hundreds of these things and we start grouping them together to, to form sequences and then chapters, you know, and at a certain point start stringing them together in the editing program and watching it and taking a, you know, and in, in, in using our judgment about how well they're flowing together. And once that is in the ballpark, right, and as we say, the cement is starting to harden, you know, we begin production of the animation and we select the art, the the right archival that will, um, you know, help illustrate these ideas. And what I really like about the film is it 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 definitely balances kind of the more playful end of things. You know, kind of some of these anecdotes we hear from the talking heads. You know, they're they're quite sort of quirky and funny, but it it doesn't shy away from from the darker side as well. I'm thinking in particular of you know the the audio we have from Joshua Cook and you know, his kind of obsession with the matrix and where that took him. So, you know, was it important to you to balance those different aspects? And what did you want people to take away in the end? You know, is, is there something optimistic to be taken away from thinking about, you know, how different ways in which we try to find meaning in things, but is there a darker side to people kind of getting too into these conspiracy theories and, and the kind of moralistic questions that poses for, for everyday life? Yeah, well, um... I mean, clearly, it's important to me that parts of this movie are funny and playful. And, you know, when I talk about simulation theory, you know, with my friends, we often get to places that we find kind of, kind of funny, but I would be naive not to realize that there's a dark side of not believing the world is real, not believing your actions have consequences, not believing other people are important. And you don't even necessarily need a simulation theory to put you into that place, but this is one path to get there. And you know, when we came across Josh Cook's story, um, it felt like a good way to make some of these consequences real. If the first, you know, hour and ten minutes of the movie are kind of playfully entertaining this idea and batting it around and gazing at your navel and you know letting your imagination go where it goes um at a certain point we want to get real and you know making this movie and throughout 2019 and in the first half of 2020 um thinking about the different realities that different people have been building and living in um wasn't necessarily putting me in an optimistic place. <laughs> um, you know, I feel I, I can see, you know, if we're, you know, even going to just restrict the conversation to COVID, you know, vaccinations are starting to roll out. So I see a, a light at the end of the tunnel. But, um, you know, this movie was made during <laughs> what felt like some pretty dark days. And then finally, you know, do you already know what topic you're going to tackle for your next film? Is it another obsession that we're going to delve into? I might take a I might take a break from that. In a way, I see these three films as kind of the completion of a cycle. Um, I'm never going to walk away from documentaries and the subjective experience and the interest I have in 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 poking at that. But um, it might be that you're surprised about um, what the next one turns out to be.
Okay, great. Well, leaving us in suspense. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing all that with me and for this um, fascinating film. And best of luck with its release. I hope lots of people get to see it. I appreciate that. Great to talk to you, Sarah. Thanks, Rodney. Cheers.